almost all of us here have heard the word self-made millionaire. Have you? Anyone here? You've heard the word self-made millionaire. That statement suggests that the individual arrived at that status by their own choice alone. Him or her, they got there by themselves alone. And also, you may have been, I uh, definitely have, been at the other side of a statement that goes like, you've made your bed, so lie on it. I don't know if you have. Basically saying the same thing, it is your choice alone that has brought you to this place. And what, what, what's, what's the point here? We all have choices to make in life. Every one of us. Whether you are the other side of um, being a millionaire or the ones that is suffering some messy situation, each one of us have choices to make in life. And God has given us a free will. God has given each and every one of us free will. But supposing we say there's choices to make, fine. But supposing if I, I am, imagine now I'm your butler in charge of your wardrobe. Okay, and tonight you've got dinner to go to. And I'm in charge of your wardrobe, okay? So I decide what you should wear. And then maybe I present before you two colors to choose from. Um, maybe color one is blue and color two is pink. Whether it's a shirt for a, a guy or a dress for a, a lady. And you choose, which one would you choose, by the way? <laughs> okay, but just got distracted there <laughs> because she's wearing blue. Um, yeah, you choose blue. Okay, that, let's go with that. So she chose blue. Did she make a choice? Yeah? But what about the seven other colors or the five other colors I never presented? So she did make a choice, but she was assisted in her choice making. Why? Because I know what's best for her, or at least I'm in charge of her wardrobe. Again, God has given all of us the free will to choose. We all have will to choose. Okay, look at another way to look at it. I bet maybe when you came into this room, um, you may have gone down this aisle. Yeah? And maybe Kenneth chose the other aisle. It's a choice. You, you, you looked at the aisle one and say, nah, not that one. I prefer aisle two. But you've only chosen these two aisles because I've put a seat in front. In other words, you may have come into this room without no seat and decide to go diagonal because you prefer walking diagonal. You don't want anything on your way. Or may prefer to hang by the wall and just take it easy and just go side by side. Yeah? But because I've put some few things in front, I've assisted your choice making. And I'm saying this way or that way, I chose, I'm asking you to choose this way, not that way, because this is better for you. Don't even think about anything here. Don't even bother here. <laughs> Amen. So we are all being given a gift of choice. What's the point? God has given us free will. But as a good, and that's the key word here, as a good father that he is, and our creator, he often tries to assist our choice making. Amen. Often tries to assist us to make the right choice. Yeah? So today we are focusing on what? The purpose of wilderness. Whose idea in the first place is this wilderness we're talking about? God, man, Satan? Whose idea? But before we go any further, let's look at what constitutes wilderness. Last week we had fun talking about this subject. But today we want to start with what constitutes a wilderness. Number one is lack of progress. Or if you like, call it stagnation stagnation where you got stuck in a situation just never moving never changing those are the things that constitute 
how you know that you're experiencing wilderness. Number two, unfruitfulness. Unfruitfulness. In other words, you're doing something, you're doing the right thing, but it seems not to be producing any fruit. Okay? Number two, number three, sorry, frustration. That feeling that I've got to be somewhere else, but why am I still here? You know, you just have that constant frustration. Uh, this, this, there's something wrong. You just kind of sense there's something wrong, but you can't put your finger on it. Now, there are many other things we could put in this category. Please let the Holy Spirit give you orders. If you're making notes, the one that comes to your mind that he mentioned, make a note of that. So I've just written little. Just those are the things that constitute wilderness. For example... I know, we know, and I want to mention here, everyone experiences this. This doesn't escape anyone. Everyone, at one point in their life, experiences the wilderness. That feeling of wilderness. Our brother Job in the Bible experienced his own. But look at what Job called his situation in Job chapter 3. Sorry, chapter 7, verse 3. I, too, have been assigned months of fruit futility, long and weary nights of misery, months of seems to not be working, long nights of weary, long and weary nights of misery. By saying assigned, Job is kind of making a suggestion here, saying that this is not my choice alone. Back to our introduction, assisted choice. Job is kind of hinting, assigned means, hang on a minute, I don't know how I got here. Even if I know, I don't think it's just all me that I ended up in this situation. Yet, we're in a world that says, you're a self-made millionaire, or you've made your bed, lie on it. In other words, it's only by your choice that you get where you got. Amen. Let's keep moving. So, but before we go further, I'm just going to interject something in between here. And I pray the Holy Spirit will give us understanding. Now, in the wilderness, there's something very, very important. Because if we're saying it's not just our choice alone that we came to the wilderness experience, whatever that could be, I'm trying not to mention what it is because it varies from one person to another. Some people in marriage, some people in relationships, some people in finance, some people in one thing or the other. In life, basically. Amen. Now, but there's a key thing here. Self-help does not work in the wilderness. Self-help. What do I mean by self-help? I'm going to sort this out all by myself. If you didn't get there all by yourself, which is what we're kind of suggesting in this message so far, you didn't get there just by yourself. Trying to now look within you only to solve it will not help. The only way to look when we are in the wilderness is up, not down. When I say down, I mean, you know, what can I, my wisdom, human wisdom, does not work when we are stuck in a wilderness experience. It is not a time to rely on one's strength, human wisdom, or capacity. But rather a time to look for help from who? Above. The time of wilderness is a time to look for help from above. There's no well. Now look at thinking of the physical wilderness now or desert. There's no well of water. So don't bother digging. Amen? In other words, what usually would work? You know, if you're in a place and there's no water, what should you do? Yeah, let's, be, let's contribute on this. If you're in a place and there's no water at all, what we'd normally do, we get a shovel, we get a, and we dig for water. Okay? But what you're saying now, in the wilderness, is you, there's no water, don't bother digging. Because it's a dry and desert land. There's no water, even if you dig, no matter how deep your hole you, 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 you're digging, you're not going to get anything. So self-help Human wisdom, what we know to do, what, how we normally solve a problem, does not work in the wilderness. You know why? 
Fresh water only comes from the rock in the wilderness. And that rock is Christ Jesus for us. You know that story very well if you're a child of God here and you've been reading your Bible. You know that the rock is where God, how God used to provide water for his children in the wilderness. Basically, the wilderness is a place to expect what? Can someone tell me? Miracles. Wilderness is a place to expect miracle. When you're experiencing wilderness, having a wilderness experience, in any situation, in any area, just expect God's hand to help. Yeah? Because in the wilderness, he supplied bread for them. He made a way for them. He gave them supplies of meat. He led them by pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of cloud by night. Even their sandals did not damage God protects in the wilderness. Amen. All right. Okay. Let's go to oh, Proverbs. I want us to now read Proverbs. Because we're talking about what is the purpose of with this wilderness. Why do we sometimes go through things that feel uncomfortable? Yeah? We go through sometimes things that feel uncomfortable. Is it just because the world is full of sin? Or what? Proverbs chapter 20, verse 24. The Lord directs our steps. So why try to understand everything along the way? That's actually a huge statement there. Now, is that statement saying, does it really mean literally why try to understand it? No, it's trying to say, don't worry if you don't understand it. Okay? Because there's nothing wrong to want to know God's ways. Amen. So let's not, I want us to read it in the proper light of the scripture. Because God wants us to know his ways. He said about Moses, the children of Israel knows what? His works, his miracles. But Moses knows my ways. Yeah? So the Lord directs our steps. So why do we try? Why try to understand everything? Chapter 16, verse 1 and 9 says, verse 1 and also verse 9 says, we can make our own plans, but the Lord gives the right answer. We can make, in verse 9, we can make our plans, but the Lord determines our steps. We can make our plans, but the Lord determines our steps. Now, here's where we want to ask the question. Whose idea, and if you've read the book of Exodus and you know the story of the children of Israel, whose idea is the wilderness? Yeah? Yeah, there's no wrong, right, right or wrong answer. If you get it wrong, we just will smile and just act like nothing happened. <laughs> Amen. Okay. So, <laughs> yeah. God. That's a perfect answer there. That man reads his Bible. <laughs> Why do we say God's, it was God's idea for his children to go through the wilderness? God leads us through the wilderness for our own good. And, not for, and for his glory as well. Two things. He leads us through the wilderness for one, our own good. But for his glory. Amen. Okay. Exodus chapter 3, verse 1. I'm going to jump around in scriptures because I don't have time to read all of them. Please, we encourage people here to read the Bible for yourself. Have questions, send questions. We love challenging ourselves. I think if you should see us sometimes at, uh, when we meet, the pastors here in this church, we argue, I think, um, <laughs> when I say argue, we debate the scripture down to the ground, we break it down just to make sure we are preaching the right things. Amen. We're not debating it just to prove a point, we're debating it to challenge ourselves to make sure we're not settling for our own comfort or what we like or what we don't like. We want to make sure that the, this house is built on the foundation of God's Jesus and his word. Amen. 
And the accuracy of that teaching saves lives. It does. Amen. Okay. Exodus chapter 3, verse 1. One day Moses was tending the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian. Midian. He led the flock far into the wilderness. Where? Wilderness, yeah. And came to Sinai, the mount of the mountain of God. So where is this mountain? I need a response from you. Where is this mountain? Wilderness. What mountain is this? The mountain of God. Mount Sinai called the mountain of God. Verse, we're going to come back to that point much later. The mountain of God. Verse 5. Do not come any closer. The, the Lord warned. Take off your sandals for you are standing on holy ground. We all know that very well. God answered in verse 12. Jump to verse 12. God answered after Moses asked some questions. I will be with you. And this is your sign that I am the one who has sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God at this very mountain. This is the first time the purpose of them coming to the wilderness was established. That's why we're reading this place. You will come and worship at this very mountain. And what did I say? Where is this mountain? Mount Sinai. And where is this mountain located? In the wilderness. Okay, we will find out why I'm making hints here. Or we're touching these places. Now, again, just to support what we we're talking about earlier, that God leads us. I, I loved it when I saw this statement from Paul. Um, that we just don't determine everything. We're not just making our choices. It's not just our choices that gets us everywhere we want to. When you succeed, don't ever allow yourself to allow yourself to say, you know, I got here by my choice alone. Yeah, don't do that. This is what Paul said in Acts of the Apostles, chapter 17, verse 26 and 28. From one man. He created this Paul talking to the, the um, debating with other philosoph uh, philosophers in Athens. So from one man, he created all the nations throughout the whole earth. He's talking about God. He decided beforehand when they should rise and fall. Who decides? God decides when they should rise and fall. And he determines their boundaries. God determines their boundaries. His purpose was for the nation to seek after God. And I, this is this next line, I've, I struggle with that. And perhaps feel their way towards him. What is his purpose for determining their boundaries? And what is his purpose for their rise and fall? Is so that the nations, so that men, nations here means people, will seek after God. Yeah? And perhaps feel their way. In other words, not fully understanding. That's what we read earlier. The Lord directs your steps. Why try to understand everything? Paul is saying, and perhaps they feel their way towards him. In other words, they sometimes get it right. Sometimes they don't get it right. But they are making strides and they're seeking after God. Amen. Okay. Why am I saying that? I'm only saying this to say again the whole point here is about God leads. Whose idea is the wilderness? God. God's idea. We've just read it in Exodus chapter 3. Now here to make it even clearer, Exodus chapter 13 verse 17 and 18. When Pharaoh finally let the people go, God did not lead them along the main road. 
when he finally let these people go, God did not lead them along the main road that runs through Philistine territories. Even though that was the short, shortest route, route to the promised land. And why? God said, if this, the people are faced with a battle, they might change their minds and return to Egypt. Verse 18, so God led them in a roundabout way through the wilderness to, towards the Red Sea. Thus, the, children, the Israelites left Egypt like an army ready for battle. There is something for me, in my mind anyway, big about this. Because it's like, it sounds to me like I could have easily get that. I could have easily received it. I could have easily owned it. But it sounds to me like if I had easily got it and I face a battle or I face a challenge, I actually would not appreciate what I have. So therefore, is God trying to suffer, cause the people to suffer? No, that's not the point. So therefore, I want them to see and depend on me all the way to the place so that when they now face battle, they will depend on me to fight their battles. Did we get that? So the reason for the long journey is so that they don't rely on themselves. It's so that they will rely on me. Where did we read again? Acts of the Apostle, Paul said, the purpose is that men will seek after him and perhaps feel their way towards him. His purpose is that we become like him. I'm talking about present day application now. Move from wilderness now come to what we are experiencing. The reason why maybe sometimes we don't always experience that quick thing happen and please, it will vary from one thing to another. Okay? But sometimes the reason why we may not just experience rest immediately in a certain area. Could it be? And that's a key question. That God wants us to depend on him all the way, the journey to rest. So that when we are now at rest, we are completely at rest. Why? Because we never got there by our strength and our wisdom. Does that make sense? That's why we said self-help does not help in the wilderness. When we are in the wilderness experience, when we are struggling with lack of progress, when we are struggling with frustration in a situation, when we are struggling with unfruitfulness, helping yourself there does not work. Because if you help yourself to get out of it, when you face a challenge, that's what is, we are reading now, or that statement is implying, you will not be able to face that challenge because now there is a new challenge and you haven't come to the maturity in that challenge. But if you, in your present challenge, whatever it is you're going through now, depend on God and go through, let him take you through that long route or route. I got corrected the other day about this my pronoun, American pronunciation <laughs> of route and route. And let God take you lo that long journey to the deliverance of that situation. You are set free forever. On that particular situation because your help comes from above and not within you amen this is what this scripture is hinting here god on purpose chose the wilderness okay he on purpose chose so that they don't run away so god's original purpose for the wilderness is worship okay we read it earlier it's worship that they may come and worship me. That they may come and become what? Intimate with me. They will come and be like me. Exodus 5 mentions that verse 1. If you're making notes, just write it down. 
but I'm going to choose because of time. Exodus chapter 7, verse 16. Then announced to him, God was talking to Moses, telling him what to say to Pharaoh. The Lord, the God of Hebrews, has sent me to tell you, let my people go so they can worship me in the wilderness. Until now, you have refused to listen to me. The purpose for God is that they come and worship in the wilderness. I want to say something here. The purpose of God, let's think about it together, is that they come and worship him in the wilderness. Present day application. So let's use that um, wilderness noun as a dry, patchy area. Yeah? In terms of lo physical location. But let's look at it as an experience. It would be what we've mentioned. Lack of progress. Lack of fruit. And frustration. And many others you, we could add. What we are reading is saying... God is dwelling there. Where is the mountain? The mountain of God is in the wilderness. My mind couldn't understand. I struggled a bit. I'm saying, why wasn't God dwelling in Canaan? Why is he dwelling in the wilderness? Because he knew where they were heading. He could have waited for them there. And get them to the Canaan straight away and they can worship in Canaan. No, he wants them to meet him in the wilderness. Could it be that sometimes when we go through things, it's actually a place of worship? It's actually God calling us to the mountain. Does that make sense? When you are in a Round around roundabout circle over a situation. That is not necessarily God you trying to kill us or Satan trying to deal with us and all those things. That situation, if you look at it in the light of what we're talking about, is actually to understand that God is in this situation, and what I need to do here is to worship. Worship means put my focus on him, praise him over this circumstance, praise him over this situation, magnify him over the situation, trust in his deliverance, trust in his salvation, trust that he is leading me along the way and he will bring me to the place of rest in that situation. Amen. So what we just read here tells us that God's idea is wilderness to the purpose of it from God's idea is what? Worship. Intimacy with God. So what I'm trying to say to us is that when we go through wilderness experience, so if you're going through any, I am going through a wilderness experience in an area in my life, and I'm trusting God for that. With this message, what that means for me is that this is a place for me to focus on him. Amen. And get even more intimate in my situation. Not outside the situation. Amen. In that situation, seek after God. That's what Paul was saying. His purpose is that men will seek after him and perhaps feel their way towards him. And perhaps he will lead them out of it. Now, we've talked about whose idea is wilderness. Yeah? Who then determines how long we stay in the wilderness? Second question. Yeah, just try if you make a mistake we'll all laugh no problem <laughs> okay if we say god's idea is to go through not stay in the wilderness go through okay whose idea is it who determines how long i stay in the wilderness oh us god yeah Okay, that's good, that's good. Both, both, uh, yeah, both. I think both is a better answer, isn't it? Both is a better answer. Okay. Yes, you guys are right. Let me look at my notes. Yeah, you're right. It's, it's 
<laughs> Sorry. Yes, it's God and our faith. Amen. It is God and our faith that determines how long we stay in the wilderness. His idea is not to leave us in the wilderness. It's not to get us there and get stuck there. His idea is that we go through it. And he's not going through it to kill us. He's going through it so to make us better. So that when he looks at us, what he's seeing is Christ Jesus. The image of himself. Amen. But how long we stay in that school of wilderness is how we depend on him. How much we trust in him. Amen. How much we trust in him. For scripture's sake, let's just mention some few. Exodus, no, sorry, not Exodus. Numbers starting verse 25 and 28. And also we're going to touch 30 and 33. This is very, very interesting. After exploring, exploring the land of for 40 days. How many days? 40 days. Okay, what it means is that the children of Israel have actually have moved and they've come to a particular situation now where they were now standing, it will only take them 40, it took them only 40 days to enter Canaan and even explore it. They came out with big grapes and wonderful fruit. I mean, such a big vine of fruit or um, grapes two people couldn't even one person can't carry it you need two people with a stick in between just over their shoulder the, the land is literally flowing with milk and honey amen so but the key thing here is 40 days the men returned to Moses and Aaron and the whole community of Israel um, of the whole community of Israel at Kadesh in the wilderness of Paran, they reported the whole, they reported to the whole community what they had seen and shown them the fruits they had taken from the land. There was, this was their report to Moses. The, their report was, we entered the land, we, and the land you sent us to explore, it was indeed a bountiful land. Who's, who said it was a bountiful land in the first place? God. We said that in the, old, the last week. They didn't know. They have never been there. But God told them it's a land flowing with milk and honey. Now they are testifying that what God said is true. Amen. So indeed, it's a bountiful land. A land flowing with milk and honey. Here is the kind of fruits it produced. But the people living, but the people living there are powerful and their towns are large and fortified. We, we even saw giants there the descendants of Anak. But immediately in verse, the next line, um, I think verse 30, um, Caleb quieting the people as they stood before Moses from verse 30, I'm reading, Let, let's go at once and take the land, he said. We can certainly what? Conquer it. Yeah? But the other men who had explored the land with him dis dis disagreed. We can go up, we can't go up against them. They are stronger than we are. Who, they are stronger than we are. So they've made a conclusion on this situation. They report their, so they spread this bad news, key, key word there. They spread this bad, news, bad report about the land among the Israelites. The land we traveled through and explored with will devour anyone who goes to live there. All the people we saw were huge. We even saw giants there. They repeated themselves. Next to them, descendants of Anak, next to them, we felt like grasshoppers. And that's why, and that's what they thought too. So we felt like grasshopper, and they think so too. Let me just quickly say something here. So where am I reading this? These people are already at a situation whereby they're about to enter Canaan. They're about to now come out of wilderness. Yeah? But they're now faced with what? A challenge. They're faced with a challenge. Remember, if you go quick, what we're talking about, God said if they allow them to just go quickly, they will give up. Yeah? Here, that is almost happening again. Now they are so close to wilderness, 
faced with a challenge, they want to quit and run out and run back. Yeah? So, and what, what is the issue here? God, if you read the story, God got, got angry with them and everything. Actually, another passage of the scripture says something. Here, actually, I, I didn't pull that one out. God then commanded them to turn around. God spoke to Caleb. If you read it for yourself, God spoke to Moses and Aaron and tell these people, don't go further to, the world, to Canaan. Turn the other way. And this is how they stayed in the wilderness. For what? 40 years. When they were standing before the place that could have taken them 40 days. But how did they stay long here? Remember what the, que what the question we're answering here. Who determines? Yeah? Who determines? God is about to bring them in. But their faith, lack of faith in his ability is the reason why they went round and round the circle. So let's try to recap what we've talked about. God's idea is wilderness. But his idea for wilderness is not to punish people. His idea for wilderness is that they may seek after him who is able to help them. His idea of a wilderness to see is for them to see that he can provide in the wilderness. His idea for wilderness is that when you're going through that problem, you know that it's not what you can do that saves us. His idea of wilderness is so that when you're looking around, it, basically what it means is that I should not be succeeding, but I am. That doesn't make sense. That is a testimony to God. When you are in a challenge that should take your life, but it didn't. It is a testimony to the glory of the God. Where we are in a place where we are stuck round and round. And people say there's no way he could make it or she can make it. But you are making it. Not getting out of it quickly. But even in that situation, God provides. God makes a way. He keeps your heart at peace. You're not looking all sad and down. and No. You're happy. You're jo full of joy. It is a testimony to him. Amen. So he's taking us through the wilderness, but he's doing his, his idea for it is so that we may be like him in worship. Amen. Seek after him. And we have the right to determine how long we stay in that situation because his ultimate goal is not wilderness. His ultimate goal is completely rest. Amen. His ultimate goal is complete rest. Okay. So I'm going to mention these three things and we'll stop for today. How we escape wilderness. The cross. Number one. The cross is how we escape the wilderness. Number one. The cross simply means Jesus. And everything he has done for us. A complete understanding and focus and dependence on Jesus is how we escape the wilderness. Number two, trust. Our trust, which basically is our faith. A childlike faith is how we follow God through the wilderness. Amen. Not depending on our ability and human wisdom. And number three, obedience to Christ. Amen. Obedience to Christ. I use the word, I use the let alpha, um, numbers here, and those numbers mean a lot. It means that one, Christ, and one produces two. Amen? He produces our faith. He produces the trust. And our faith is what produces our obedience. When you don't trust a person, you, why should you obey them? Amen? Amen? But it's because we trust him, that's why we obey him. Amen. We're going to end with Hebrews chapter 4. Which is where we started in part 1. And next week, if God wills, we might talk about enjoying wilderness. Because another dimension of wilderness the Holy Spirit opened up to me. That probably takes this message to a different place again. Hebrews chapter 4, we end with that on verse 11. So let us, 
do our best to enter that rest. But if we disobey God as the people of Israel did, we will fall. The, re- the fall here means is that we're not going to get out of the situation. And the so disobedience here is just not trusting God. Amen. Not trusting God. It's not disobedience in terms of they lied, they, they, they did this, they did that. No, they did not believe him. They did not trust in his ability to save them. That's why they stayed in the wilderness. I, I don't want this message to be just a knowledge-based message. I don't want it to just be, oh, wow, that's nice, that's wonderful, that's brilliant. Now I know there's a purpose for wilderness. The question is, are you going through any? Is there any area in your life that you feel like you're not making progress as you would like to? Or experiencing unfruitfulness? Or even frustrated? That area is an area that God wants you to come to the mountain. It's not an area he wants you to get out of quickly. That's not the plan. The plan is not get out of the situation. No. The plan is that he wants you there, but he wants you there as long as you're with him. And when you're now with him, he gets you out of it. And when you get out of that situation, you'll find that you'll never be there again because that's a mountain you've conquered. Because anytime the enemy challenges us again on that situation, you're at rest. He's the one fighting for you. Amen. Is that good? Thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for helping us. This work of faith, this journey of faith, which you, Christ Jesus, the author, have started in us, and you are able to finish it. Help us to trust you along the way as you have taught us today. Help us to understand that the challenges we're going through is not there to harm us. It's not there to kill us because we are covered in you already anyway. But it is there to bring out that refining, like a a fire that refines a gold, trying to bring it to a place where it shines. And only do that by sharpening our faith and trusting you. Oh God, I pray right now for everyone in this room and those who are listening. Help us. Help us. Where we are weak in faith, strengthen us. Where we are not really trusting in you and we're trusting in our ability to survive and get out of the situation, help us. In the name of Jesus. Thank you for answering our prayer. Amen.